Thank you. Buongiorno, colleghi. Where is the, okay. All in Italian? You do want to have the lecture all in Italian? I'll do it in English. Okay, that's <laughs> No, no. Okay, so I'd like to talk about revision central neck dissection for papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, I've chose this topic, or the committee chose this topic, because I think it is topical, and um, it provides a, uh, a very difficult situation in decision making in terms of what to do and how to do it. So that's me, here are my disclosures. Uh, just a nice historical picture of our Second World Congress held in Toronto. These are young, fresh faces, and these are old, not-so-fresh faces in the last World Congress uh, of our steering committee. So what is the significance of regional uh, metastatic adenopathy? Here is the uh, standardized uh, nomenclature type of diagram. Uh, outlining the sites of metastatic disease. And in my own series of a large number of patients with metastatic disease, you can see the distribution. 80% is in the central compartment, which we all know. And just as a historical vignette again, this is a slide given to me by Ernie Mazzaferi and shows the distribution of metastatic disease, which can be quite capricious and whimsical, but again, the vast majority of uh, metastatic disease occurs in the central compartment, so-called levels uh, six and seven. So what is the impact of metastatic disease? It used to be said that metastatic disease in the neck did not portend a poor prognosis. We looked at um, our series and found, in fact, that you know stage one, stage two disease was virtually the same in terms of, over, in terms of overall sur survival. And this was the memorial uh, um, uh, result as well, and this slide was given to me by Jay Shaw, but if you tease out uh, the um, survival by age, it appears that the older you are, the worse the survivorship with metastatic disease. So we need to really deal with this metastasis thing. And disease-free survival, that is, the chance of recurrence really uh, occurs with um, these compartments. And of course, the worst one is mediastinal disease, and the best one in terms of uh, disease-specific survival is the central compartment. Uh, what about our outcome results? Well, here are our survivals, heart survivals, uh, in a large group of patients with uh, no recurrence, one recurrence, and, three, and two recurrences. And you can see, the more you get recurrence, the worse it is. So recurrences, it is said, beget re uh, recurrences. And this is the same in terms of disease-specific survival in terms of recurrences. So again, group one, no recurrence, group two, one recurrence, then multiple recurrences, group three. So once you go down that slippery slope, it's worse every time you get a recurrence. So it's better to deal with recurrences uh, optimally at the first go. So how do we surveil these patients? Uh, I needn't uh, educate this audience. You could educate me, and Peter Kopp gave a very beautiful uh, presentation on how these patients are, are detected in terms of uh, recurrence. And, you know, the more of these we do and the more that uh, appear in, in terms of incidence, the more we're going to pick up recurrences. So the conundrum is what do you do with these recurrences? This is a very odd situation where the central compartment recurrence was detectable by palpation, but most of the time they're not. They're biochemical or radiographic uh, um, uh, pickups. And again, a slide by, given to me by Ernie in the early days of thyroglobulin showing that one of our, uh, our touchstones in terms of recurrent detection is TG determination. Uh, we also have the ability to, de to detect these recurrences by uh, radiographic techniques as shown here, and here's an ultrasound showing a paratracheal recurrence. Here are several CTs showing uh, paratracheal recurrences. And here's a slide given to me by Mike Tuttle showing that uh, sometimes you can even detect these recurrences by, um, by radionuclide scanning. And here's a case of uh, a recurrence that was positively identified in the neck by RAI, uh, but negative on PET. And here's another case that was negative on RAI, but positive on PET. This makes sense in patients who have uh, undifferentiated, poorly differentiated cancer because PET takes advantage of uh, actively dividing cells. And oddly enough, here's a case of a patient 
uh, detected by scanning who had two populations of cells, one that was uh, positive on RAI and one a different population of cells detected by PET. Very unusual. So do we intervene or do we not intervene? Um, the guidelines are quite clear and at the same time somewhat nebulous, but uh, needless to say for eight millimeter nodules or more, we get a little bit more interested. Eight millimeter nodules or less, we're less interested. What are the options? Well, observation is an option. Radiofrequency ablation is an option. The Italians are pioneers in this, and we, we really, uh, I don't know what the outcomes of this are, but I've, uh, I'd be anxious to see the results. We've uh, adopted alcohol ablation for smaller nodules, and of course, reoperation. Uh, what do we know about observation? Well, we can extrapolate the, the data and the biological activity as espoused by uh, professors Ito and Miyachi on primary disease. This is not breast cancer. This is not lung cancer. These are slow-growing, indolent nodules, as we know from the Ito and Miyachi study. And I needn't belabor this. I'm sure everybody's seen these slides. And basically, uh, this tumor is very indolent. And one centimeter or less, or even 1.5 or 2 centimeter <laughs> primary tumors can be observed. So why can't we do that for metastatic lesions? And the answer is intuitively, probably. Um, so we have recommendations from the ATA who recommend that uh, these disease, the, this disease, metastatic disease, be addressed which we do do, but the way we address it can vary. So um, the group in, at Memorial has uh, detected these nodules and given us uh, and taught us the option of surveillance. And here's a, a picture of uh, Mike Tuttle and myself and a young woman who is yet to be identified. <laughs> but, I but I think with all respect to Brian McIver, I'm not, <laughs> I, we, we, we won't say any more about this picture, but Mike, Mike has told me he's, he's following by surveillance how many, a couple of hundred of these things now, and really, they're doing nothing. So why can't we do that? Why do we have to enter into this dangerous operative situation? And further, then uh, we, can, we can do um, ultrasound radiofrequency ablation. Um, but one of the things I think we should all look at is um, uh, alcohol ablation, and this works. The Mayo people have, uh, have espoused this, and it's cheap. I do it in the clinic chair, it takes five minutes, two applications, and about 85% of the time, these very tiny nodules disappear. Central compartment dissection is a heart-rending operation, and you want to avoid this at all costs. I used to do this on all comers, and now I'm very selective because we've got surveillance and alcohol ablation in our armamentarium. But it's a difficult operation because of previous fibrosis and uh, anatomical abnormalities as a result of the fibrosis. So we do use nerve monitoring, Greg, for these things. Uh, and here, I'm going to show a, a short video in a second, but basically here is the, uh, the menu that I use in order to uh, address this, which, you know, when I started this, there was no roadmap, so I kind of worked by the seat of my pants, but we do an incision, we manage the strap muscles or dissect the carotids, because carotids are the, the best landmark because it doesn't move post-surgery. We identify the recurrent nerves, parathyroids, we do our dissection, we manage the nodes and then we close. So here is a short video um, that was initially done by Matt McGarry from Australia and modified by John Bernstein. I don't know if John's in the audience here. Um, so this is a young woman, I think in her 20s, and she had a paratracheal recurrence in this area, it was greater than a centimeter, so I thought surgical, a surgical approach was appropriate. A typical radiographic appearance with stipple calcifications. We do nerve monitoring on these patients. We remove the uh, the original scar. Why? Why? Better wound healing. If you take out that fibrotic area, we raise our flaps. I apologize to the endocrinologists in the room if this is too, uh, too much at breakfast, but uh, it's illustrative. 
We uh, divide the strap muscles in the midline. Uh, we divide the sternothyroid muscle on each side. I believe this gives us very good exposure. So there's the sterno, sternothyroid on the left side being divided. We use various energy devices. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. This is high stakes surgery, so uh, the best exposure you can get is, is uh, very helpful. So the strap muscles have been divided. We then reflect the, sta the strap muscles, kephalad and caudad, and expose the carotid arteries. As I said, the carotid artery is a great landmark for the recurrent nerve because it doesn't move. It's very consistent in the neck even after surgery. So here we are dividing the carotid artery in the lower left. There's the common carotid artery. Once we've done that, we can find the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And we use blunt dissection to do that. So the head is at the bottom of the screen and the feet are at the top of the screen. There's the recurrent nerve as it enters under the uh, anominate. And then we trace the recurrent nerve into its insertion in the posterior aspect of the cricothyroid joint. Now, here's the tricky part. What you need to do is be able to find uh, parathyroids. So here are the inferior parathyroids being dissected on the thymic pedicle to ensure their blood supply. So we dissect the, um, the right inferior parathyroid, and then we reflect it inferiorly. You can see the anominate artery beating there. And we do the same thing on the other side. This is a very tricky maneuver because you really don't know how many parathyroids are left by the previous surgeon. And we often get patients referred to us from all parts of the country for this. So here's the left lateral view and there's the left um, uh, parathyroid and the recurrent nerve. So once you've got all your ducts in order, everything's out of the way, you can dissect out the uh, central compartment. This was done some years ago and nowadays we don't do a bilateral central compartment dissection if there's no nodularity on the other side. In this particular case I did a bilateral central compartment and we use energy, uh, bipolar energy as a cutting instrument and then unipolar energy as well. And we're taking the specimen off the trachea. Now sometimes there's nodularity, there's nodes lateral to the recurrent nerve, which we have to address. I used to try to do this on block, but I thought that was a useless maneuver and jeopardized the recurrent nerve. So I do these as separate specimens. So this is the uh, right lateral central compartment being dissected lateral to the recurrent nerve. So here's the field at the end of the operation. There's the inferior parathyroid glands on their thymic pedicles. Here's a lateral um, left view showing the inferior parathyroid, the recurrent nerve, and the superior, superior parathyroid on that side, the common carotid artery. And here is a right lateral view showing the pedicle of the uh, parathyroid, the recurrent nerve, and uh, <coughs> common carotid artery. Here's the fine, we, we test the nerves, of course, and here's the final closure. So here's the path specimen. So there's the central compartment with the two lateral nodes to the recurrent laryngeal nerve on a, on a cartoon. So, I've done 294 of these cases by myself only. Our vocal cord injury rate is 1.5, which, you know, people shudder at that, but I think it's pretty good, uh, uh, keeping in mind that this is a, um, a uh, revision procedure, or some of them are second, third, or fourth revisions. Permanent hypopara is about 7%, and many of these cases already came with permanent hypoparathyroidism. And here's the important figure. We normalized TG in 65% of the patients. And this was done by an audit by somebody as, at arm's length, so I'm not fudging the numbers here. And I think that's pretty damn good considering the severity of this disease. So the take-home messages here are that papillary thyroid cancer is being detected with increased frequency. We know that because of our friendly ultrasonographers. Metastatic lymph node involvement is common, although the influence on outcome is debatable. 
except in patients over 45 years, according to the um, memorial study and so on. And the incidence of subsequent nodal disease increases with the discovery of metastatic nodes at initial, at, at initial surgery. Detection of metastatic neck nodes is being if affected with increasing accuracy and increasing uh, incidents, and I'm still not sure that we all know what to do with these things, but at least we have sur surveillance and alcohol ablation and maybe RF, RF uh, uh, radiofrequency ablation in our arm armamentarium. The commonest site of recurrent neck disease is the central compartment, upper mediastinum, we know that. Management of metastatic neck nodes is controversial, we know that. Several modalities are available to manage metastatic nodes, but observation is a viable option. We know that from Mike's study now and other studies. And uh, we've shown a technical stepwise uh, approach to central neck and upper mediastinum. Thank you. <laughs>